What's up? Welcome to the Serving It Up podcast, where I get to know individuals through the three pillars of eat good, look good, and live great. Now, today's guest, he goes by the name Chef Dev. He worked in kitchens for years before becoming a private chef. He's a regular host on City Line TV. He's the host of LCBO Five Stops, as well as a judge on Food Network's Fire Masters, and an ambassador for brands such as food, such as Food Dudes. Weber Grills and All Clad. Welcome to the podcast, Mr. International, Devin <laughs> Raj Kumar, my man, Chef Dev. What's good, dude? Incredible welcome. It is so warm. I, you know, it's, it's, it's interesting when you start saying all that stuff, it's like sinking in a little bit. Uh, and I'm very proud of that, to be honest. I'm very proud of you. And I'm, I'm very happy that you have me on this, uh, on this podcast of yours. So I'm glad we can make it happen. Absolutely. And first off, I'm going to say is love your shirt. Love the little tie dye. Yeah. Love the tie dye. All right, loving dude. it, man. Welcome to the podcast, and hope y'all you're doing amazing. You've just been killing it. Um, we're gonna get right into it because I know you're a busy, busy man. You got a pretty hard stop. So right from the get go, I always say, brilliant savant. You know him. He always the French uh, gastronome. He's always like, tell me what you eat, and I'll tell you what you are. So I asked you to give me some sort of food or some sort of drink, and then um, let me know what it is. So what did you choose, and what did what are we eating? So, you know, what's interesting, Chef, is that now that I'm doing more, I, I think now that I'm further along in my career, and don't get me wrong, I have a long way to go, but I'm finding so much more now that when I'm cooking, I want to be cooking things that provide me with nostalgia, that take me back to a certain period of time in my life. I was doing this Zoom call yesterday, a cooking class for Amazon, and I tied in the dish that I was making into my childhood, and I shared with them that I didn't know all these experience of going here as a kid or sitting on the floor with my grandmother making this or, you know, burning eggs as a kid. I didn't realize that all these things would impact me so much um, now. So what I did today, speaking of eggs, um, as I made it, can I show you? Of course, absolutely. Yeah, so, so I made an omelet, but what, what makes it like nostalgic is not only just the fact of cooking eggs and stuff, I went with a no color omelet, super runny. But what I did was for Amazon yesterday, I did a, uh, I did a, a jerk sauce and I did the homemade jerk sauce for my Weber Grills video, which I did recently. And uh, it's completely from scratch and I'm very proud of it. And I love sharing these things. I really try to make recipes more accessible. And um, I like mine super runny, so it should still be quite runny on the inside. But we have a really nice jerk omelet and I also run scallion through it, aiming for no color here, a little bit of mold and, and um, yeah, you smell all spice, you smell cinnamon, scotch okay. bonnet, lime, garlic, thyme, tamarind. That's how I, I want to start my day, bro. You told me to make, you told me you're going to do something jerk, something jerk. So Yeah, I had the jerk. I took, and I did my own little jerk thing. Um, so I've got here is a little tomato, uh, summer tomato and uh, stone fruit salad, but with jerk vinaigrette. So I took some jerk spice with like all, with your, you know, your all spice, uh, a little bit of pineapple and I mixed it all up. Nice. I got that. We got a little snack here. Super fresh, super yeah. summery, fantastic yeah. look, man. Umami exploding everywhere. Great look. Sure. Amazing. All right, dude. While we get to eat that, let's, uh, let's start getting right into it, dude. So first things first, cheers, my man. Enjoy. Salute. Thank you. Mm. All right. Before I get talking, put this down. I'm just going to jump into Do Not Disturb. Apologize. It's all good, Chef. As I just got a phone call there, but yeah, do not, this is, uh, man, butter and jerk is the move. Jerk seasoning is one of those things where it's so aromatic. It's so aromatic, and when you eat it, you know exactly what it is. You'll know, be like, this is jerk spice. It's that allspice. It's all that garlic, that scallion. Do you put any peppers in yours? I put an aggressive amount of scotch bonnet. I always say that jerk has to have a little bit of punch. And uh, if you do, if it doesn't hurt a little bit on the way out, on the way out, if it doesn't hurt a little bit going down. Like I've guys said that in the recording. If it doesn't hurt a bit going down, then then I don't think it's jerk. It should. I say in the video too. It's like it should wind you a little bit. Yeah, for sure. I agree. It Love should, you. you need that punch, or else it's not there. It's not jerking. You know, it's, you're not acting like a jerk. Right. And I haven't been to Jamaica, but. Um, you know, I've grown up eating jerk food and like, you know, the proper places I, that, that, that I would say the proper places that do it, it punishes you a bit. Man, Adrian Forte had a restaurant called AF1 in Toronto several years ago. Did you ever go? No. The, no, no, the, no, chicken, was, the chicken was already lava chicken. And then your boy was garnishing with like half scotch bonnets. He would chop scotch bonnet up, rough chop it and put it on top. And it was just like, sure. 
my head's on fire. But apparently, but shout out to Adrian not- Forte. Adrian was good. You did amazing yeah, no doubt. this season, dude. Great representative of the city. All right, Dev, let's get right into the food. Let's get right into eat good, okay? So for those who don't know, you actually worked in tons of you worked in tons of restaurants, you worked in food dudes before you became what we all know as Chef Dev right now. Um, so when you were when you know, when you were doing that, where you're cooking in restaurants and everything, you left and you did this whole giant six month stint and you went all over the world. Right? You went to what, India, Dubai, Italy, Peru, London, England. Like, Bro, you do your homework, eh? What was that trip about? Impre- it's super impressive, Wallace. Um, in 2015, I went to go open up Oma. I've been doing my private thing for a couple of years after leaving yeah. Lux. I'm still working with food dudes, you know, as brand ambassador. But 2015, I go to open up Oma. With, I'm working in between Map London and Andrew Wilson. It's a food dudes establishment. But just getting the opportunity to work with those two chefs was a, was a big deal for me. Um, and then from there... I, even during that time, even before going to Oma, I knew I was going to get away in 2016. I knew I had to get out of my shell. I knew I had to go where it's a bit uncomfortable and I needed more experience. I didn't know leaving in 2016, it would leave to all the travel opportunities and everything that I have going on today. I didn't know that. I just knew I had to get away. I went into debt. I worked up, saved a lot of money. I went into debt. And then early 2016, I took off for six months and I just worked anywhere that I could. I networked on the way. Um, and you know what's so amazing, Chef, is that uh, several things on that 2016 trip led to work abroad in 2018, 2019, 2020. So, like, just like for, to give you two examples, I'm traveling through through Europe at this point, and my one of my good friends that I grew up with in Richmond, Hill, Samir Damani, he's getting married in Glasgow, and I'm going to London. So I'm like, I'm just gonna fly to Glasgow. Sitting at the table at his reception uh, was a couple that owned a chain of Indian restaurants. Long story short, they ended up flying me out to spend seven weeks doing menu development at their restaurant in Scotland last summer. That's one thing that happened. That's what you were in Yeah, brother. Uh, That's how that happened. Another, and, and then I'm going out there to do menu development. Meanwhile, I'm learning this entire desi menu, which changed my whole game. So it's, just, it's crazy how things work out. Another quick example is working with Philip Juma, who's an Iraqi chef based out of London. Okay. And uh, he's, he's reinventing Iraqi food. And I did a demo with him in 2016 at Borough Market. I went to his pop-up randomly when I was staying in London for a month, mm-hmm. worked with him. And then this time, this year, going back, I, he has his own stall at Borough Market, my favorite market in the world. I get to do dish of, day, dish of the day, day of the dish. I get to do dish of the day with spices that I brought back from India while still traveling around. So that's just two examples of in 2016. There's so much more, uh, but that's just two examples of, of what happened from that trip. So like, so grateful I went and did that, man, because I went into huge debt. People thought I was crazy. My parents were like, you're an idiot. You know, but I just went and did it. Got you. Now, let's bring that up because you, you talk a lot about like India and all that stuff. For those who don't know, is that your style? Is that your cooking style? You know, like um, they always ask, what's your style? They all, everybody gets asked that. Man, I don't hope it's a cop-out answer to say that I'm world-inspired. I'd love to sit here and tell you that I do classical French techniques, but I don't always. I was trained with the food dudes. Like, I was doing my own thing for a while, but the food dudes gave me the bulk of my initial training. And what I, why I'm mentioning that is because I went in there and I started doing sushi and I started doing chimichurris and I started doing, you know, like I started doing so many different styles of food. We started making moles and like, it's just all over the place. I didn't just go into one route. So my style is all over the place. I consider myself an international chef because I've been cooking abroad for since 2016 now, like quite a bit. Um, like I was gone the whole three months of this, this year. I came back March 15th, right? And I guess we'll get to that in a minute, but um, I, I don't, my style, I don't know, man. I'm big flavor. What you see is what you get. Like I would gladly serve a jerk omelet to someone on a tasting menu or as a main course. Yeah. Like I just like what you see is what you get food. I like hearty food and I like to slap people around with flavor profiles, including myself, right? I just want to make it memorable. I always say to my videos, make the food memorable. It's gotta be. It's hundred yeah. percent. We do it, right? Um, one of the next thing I want to ask and talk about is, I don't know if you know, so how I found out about you and how like sort of this whole thing, the industry is small regardless, but it was, about, Tiny. it was a couple of years ago when I started getting into Chopped, um, the whole Discovered Chefs at Nella, all that stuff. It was Fight Club. It was Chefs Battle Club. That was when I, I, I heard about you. So for those who I- don't know, what was that? What was the underground chef battle? In 20, oh God, we're 2020 now, right? Yeah. I think in 2015 or 2014, Chef Joe Friday 
Chef Nico. Nico was working at Lux from Food Dudes and doing his own thing. Joe Friday, we used to work a lot together, do pop-ups, and he was doing his own thing. We were all sitting at Lux Appliance Studio one day, and we decided to have a chef battle league. At the time, Knife Fight was on television. You remember Knife Fight with Elon? Yeah. I think he was top chef one or two, season one, season one or two winner, right? Yeah. Something like that. In any case, whatever. He, he's doing Knife Fight, but we had this idea. We had this beautiful space. We had these islands, a gorgeous cooktop area, everything at Lux, and we decided to start throwing chef battles. One thing led to the next, we started getting pretty big. We had like over 100 people coming to every battle. We had big Very sponsors. Big. We, yeah, it took a lot of work. Get this, bro. It was 2014 or 2015. 2015, I'm working at OMA. I'm working like 10 a.m. to 2 a.m. Nico comes onto the line and hands me dissolution papers because for whatever reason, Joe and Nico, this is the true story. Spilling the beans, BTS right now. I haven't now. heard this. I haven't heard this. So I, I'm, yeah, I'm Nico and, 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 and like I still blame them a bit. I'm sorry, I don't blame them a bit. I'm just mentioning this right now because this is the actual story. People can make up what they want. But Joe and Nico just couldn't come to a proper agreement for whatever reason on whatever it was. And I was too busy to even care about that at the time because I was hosting, I was organizing them, et cetera, et cetera. So Nico walks in with dissolution papers. I don't even look. I just sign and, and, and off he is. I was on the line at the time. Um, and then after that, Nico and Joe went in their two different ways. Nico started the chef cartel and Joe started the underground chef company. Over the years, I went back to help Joe mostly and host for Joe. McCain ended up flying us around Canada. We held chef battles in Saskatoon, in Kelowna, in St. John's, in Montreal. Like we went all over the place. So I'm very grateful for that time, but I ended up resigning probably two years ago now. I felt like I had done enough chef competitions, hosting and competing in them, and I just wanted to chill a bit, and I decided to move on to another. I felt like it to run its course in Toronto, because man, we pushed that hard for three, four years, like pushing. It, it was really cool to see, because like, yeah. Was, it was literally, that's why I brought it up. Cause it was like our industry is so small and how we got to connect was like, we had this own little community of literally a fight club. It was almost like a fight club. It was something that not many people knew about. It wasn't really in the public, but when you knew about it, it's like this little secret thing and you go in and you've got your teams, you know, you've got your, this chef and that chef. And right. it would literally was an underground fight club for cooks, for chefs. Right, man. And we had a lot of notable people like respect, big love to everybody that came out. It was always all about love, but you know, chef Ivana Ratza, she won a season. We had chef Romaine Avril in there, like uh, Darren Engbers and Eric Wood back in the day in season one. Like we had a lot, cooks yeah. tony bacon from from montreal like we had a lot of cool chefs man so i'm very proud really of what cool. i did but it was time to move on and like this, this is actually interesting that you raise that up because like i've always just tried to do multiple things in this industry i just didn't want to work a line i just didn't want to film city line i just didn't want to do catering my hands are everywhere and now that i've been in the industry for a few years now i feel like now i can kind of select more of what i want to do i'm finding out more who i am and what i want yeah and uh, i'm helping it's helping me select be a little bit more selective because bro I was yes man forever, dude. I think literally that's why me and you connect so well. We're very similar. We're very similar in regards to that, mm -hmm. competing, sort of trying to make our own thing happen. And another thing that we actually got really, really, really similar and like we talked a lot about was this COVID cooking. <laughs> COVID cooking. You had Chef Dev at home. I had What's Cooking. And we would message each other. And we'd be like, yo, Dev, are you editing? Or like, what are you cooking tomorrow? It was insane. Bro, you were, you were posting every day. Dude, you so were much posting pressure. every day, too. No, I wasn't. People thought I was. You were close. Dude, I, was close. Like, I, I would be like, I need to make another recipe because I know Deb's going to post another one. <laughs> I was like, I was like competition. It, it wasn't a cover. It was like, I was, I was like, I don't want to post the recipe. And suddenly the next day he's posting the same one. I was worried. That was my biggest worry. I was like, no. Our recipes were very different from one another. You are very unique. But it's very different though because like i created what's cooking in regards to i didn't want to create just recipes that most people would have might might have learned or like from other other amazing <coughs> chefs you roman all these other chefs during quarantine would you know show the most classic or the, the dishes i wanted to show people just what i had at home that, right. was, that was my like thing because i was like if you want to learn how to make an amazing profiterole or like a classic frise salad or a great tart tata go to roman if you want to learn how to make like you know, amazing jerk, amazing like Badovan and curries and lentils and all these amazing flavors go to you. And so everybody had their little, like, you know, little niche. Right. I was sending, a, sorry to cut you off, but I was sending a lot of people to Matt James Duffy for a lot of people are like, yo, sourdough pizza. I was like, just go to Matt. Matt you know? is amazing at, at baking at bread. 
Uh, yeah. Watching him do it when we were at Langdon was was incredible. He'd be in. The ah, you were there together. Yeah, yeah, that's how I met him. Man, man, you worked it was, at some cool places, bro. We, we walked in. I remember, and then the guy's like, "You know, Matt Duffy, he's on TV. He's on. You know, you watch the Sh- Stratford Chef School." I was like, "Oh, I know who you are," and it was, it was cool. Um, all right, dude, let's let's talk right into something. Is so we both, you know, we talk about we don't work in restaurants anymore. Do you miss it? I, I do you miss it? A lot of people ask me if I miss it, and um, I'll, I'll initial answer no. Because after running lock and key for for several months, like you know, almost a year in 2018, man, it was hard to find staff, bro. And when we found the staff, they would just get up. Like, man, I was in the Globe and Mail. I remember because I voiced my, I was so stressed out that year. I was constantly looking for people, and I, was, I had like I'd have days where I'd have like 15 stages coming in, and no one, not one person would show up. I got real stressed out. It taught Dude, me a lot, I that do. experience, but it's so hard to make money, bro. And um, it just, it, and there was just so many different expenses. It just didn't make sense to me. Also, while it's my, my, I never, my dream was never to run a restaurant. And it's just like every question I get asked, the number one question I always get asked is when are you opening a restaurant? And I need, we need to rewire our society a little bit. Yeah. Also what I could pay staff was just so minimal for the work. And like, I'm not a big fan of restaurants and I guess I might be hypocritical because I spend so much time at restaurants. But then yeah. again, a lot of chefs, like I was just at, I was just at East uh, being a guest chef, uh, but I know a lot of chefs, it was their dream to run a restaurant. But yeah. to, to, to further answer your question, tying back in East, Man, I don't miss the restaurant because I just had two full days at East, right? Running a line. So I was doing front and back. I was running all my own dishes out and coming back in. And Sonny was helping me kick out a lot of those dishes. But I'll do the guest chef thing. And Agreed. I don't miss it too often. And then I can do chef dev secret dinners. And I do little things like that where I'm able to run a restaurant. Also, earlier this year in March, I was in Lahore. I did 100 people a night, sold out for four nights, eight services in a row. Um, same thing when I was in Nepal in February. I had to sold that restaurant for one night, so I still get tastes of the line. I still get to fire chits, expedite, work the line, et cetera, et cetera. But doing it every day, not a chance, bro. I'd rather do this kind of stuff, go walk in my backyard, go travel, go explore, relax, rest, chill. You know, if you want to go, I think to make it in this industry or any industry, you have to put in serious amounts of work. Like food dudes, we were working seven day weeks in the beginning, right? Like, I, And then for me, my personal shit, you know, we both work very hard. We've always admired that a lot. And we see the hustle, right? Like yeah, how we're trying yeah. to chase each other and stuff like that. But uh, long story short, no, I don't miss it. Facts. Like everything you Facts, literally... man. I'm not going to sit here and bullshit. Like it is what it is. Everything you just said was exactly what I sometimes tell, I tell people. It's like, A, first off, I want to be able to pay my staff or team, if I ever had somebody, a decent wage. There's, I've always talked about there's no industry where you go to school for 40K and you come on, you make less than 40K. Brother, I was working, I'm not going to say where, I was working like 14 to 16 hours a day. I was getting paid like 13 something dollars an hour, and I was getting paid for 10 hours. Yeah. Right? I'm like, fuck this shit. Well, can I swear? Yeah. Yeah, fuck this, bro. Sure. So, so th- that, that further initiated me going my own way. Like running my own catering. Bro, I did a lot of caterings. I did fucking pop-ups at $5 meals. I did pop-ups where like people wouldn't show up, bro. I did all that, yeah. you know, and now it's like I do a pop-up, it sells out real quick, but fuck, man, you got to go put in your time a little bit, and uh, if you want to make it on your own and, and do your own thing, then it takes a lot of work, but it's, it's worth it. Those, man. It's definitely, definitely, it's one where, like, when I left restaurants, everybody was like, when, exactly what you said, when you open your restaurant, when is all this stuff, I'm like, yeah, oh, yeah, yeah. People, don't, people see the amazing thing of, like, having a restaurant, but they don't see all the other stuff that happens. Um, right, and so- I get asked. And I, sorry to cut you off again. I, I get, I feel very talkative today, bro. Oh, I get asked a lot, like, man, when you open your restaurant, well, it's like a Saturday and I'm at a barbecue or it's like Sunday and we're at a picnic or something. And I'm like, if I had a restaurant, I wouldn't be here right now. Give I, me a break. This is exactly the thing with like quarantine. The amount of chefs that I'll talk to and like people that we talk to and I'll be like, how are you guys doing? They're like, I've never had this much time with my family. Like I've, I'm, they'd be like, yo, Wallace, chef. It's a Saturday afternoon, and I'm right. in my backyard with a drink with my kids. And Unheard of. I don't, they're like, I don't know if I want to go back. I was like, I don't blame you. I don't blame anybody who doesn't want to go back to the restaurant. It's very different now. It's very hard, and especially with, I think, quarantine, it, it exposed the entire industry. 
Right. As history of ever, all its weaknesses, all of its strengths. Um, and I get it. And I get it for all the restaurants that need to open and get open and everything like that. But it's difficult. It's difficult, man. And it's our industry that got hit the hardest, funny enough, too, right? So there's a lot of changes that have to be made. Uh, I'm going to continue to do what I'm doing, man. I speak with a lot of students. You know, I've judged at Centennial and done different stuff, George Brown and stuff like that. So I'm going to continue to mentor in my own way. But I just want to inspire people to to do things on their own. Let know? me ask you this, because people ask me this, too. Uh, people ask me this on, like, my TikToks and stuff, because, like, I got, a, I got a, not, um, a lot of new followers on TikTok that are a little more younger. That are, they right. want to be chefs. <laughs> they always ask me, and they're like, what's the advice to be a chef? Like, I want to be a chef. And I'm like... And I always tell them, I was like, there's, there's four things that you really got to do. You got to A, taste everything. You got to also take everything with a grain of salt. So don't act like you know everything. And then you, next thing is you got to freaking love it. If you freaking don't love to cook, it's so hard. So like, I, I send that right back to you. What's right. your advice? For I, fully, I fully agree with all three things you said, but it's the second one that you said. Um, which ties into the first thing I would say is you need to be able to accept constructive criticism. I can tell when I mention if people ask my opinion and I mention things, I can already tell that they don't even want to be hearing it. To this day, and 50,000 years from now, I'll constantly be taking constructive criticism, even if it's not valid. That's not the point. You know, for several years, man, my ego was out of control, 2013, 2014, 20, whatever, the, whatever I had going on in my life at the time. And it's when I realized that it wasn't the Devin show that things really started to happen for me, where I really had this self-awareness and really, really opened up and I started asking questions. Like, man, I'll walk into the food dude's kitchen, bro. And like, you know, people see me walk in, like, oh, fuck, you know, Dev's here. That's the, you know, I have a lot of respect for this guy or whatever the case may be, but I'm asking everybody questions, bro. How do you chef? How do you do this? How do you do that? I'm constantly, even at East, asking questions nonstop. So I think it's being able to accept constructive criticism is really important. Then yes, you need to work your ass off and be humble. But it's 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 the second thing that you said there for sure that resonates the most with me. Man. For, for those things with a grain of salt. Know about you, for those like who don't know, what's your age? How old are you? Let's to let people know. Thirty-six. Because people 36. see you right now and they'll see success. I am thirty-six yeah. now. Exactly. So, and how long, when did you start cooking? Um, in my early 20s, man. Tw in 2021. You know, I was going, I went to Lurie for a year. I went to Ryerson. I didn't know that I could enter this. I was always obsessed with food since I was a kid, but I didn't know, I didn't ever think that this is, a, you know, I should go into this career. I should spend time doing this. So, it's finally when I did that, I went to culinary school at like 23. And I'd been catering. I'd started doing private events. Bro, when I look back at the events I first did, man, I can't even look at the photos. I don't even know what I was thinking, bro. But, uh, but yeah, I've been cooking now for about 12 years, bro. Nothing crazy. So you're 36 now. For those who are watching and like, they're sort of hearing and listening and know about you, when do you really think out of those, when you started cooking to where you are right now, really was that pop-up, that, you know, that spark of your like, launched your career to where you are right now? Bro, like, man, I had a lot of glimpses of stuff that happened over the years that said, hey, maybe I got a shot at this. Or I also didn't know what I was doing, man. All the events that I was doing and all the brand work and all the promotional stuff and getting photographers to come to all my events and videography and doing these reels, I didn't know what it was all working towards. Now I have a better idea of what that is or what I want my future to look like. But before, I didn't know. But, man, there was no real, like, moment where i was like fuck boom this is it a big one bro if i could sh i have to give you something a big one for me was 2014 when i started filming city line that was a pretty cool deal man because um you know i was on television i was a regular guest expert expert it was city tv was although a lot of my friends and my demographic didn't watch it like it had quite a few views on it and stuff and it gave me a certain amount of credibility that was a pretty good thing that was pretty big but there's been things over the years man a lot of a lot of stuff i'm very grateful sweet all right, dude, I'm going to get right into the segment of the show where we call it In the Weeds. We're going right in the weeds, dude. So I'm going to send you a bunch of fires. I'm going to fire a bunch of orders. You just got to give me the first answer that comes to your head, okay? <laughs> okay. I'm going to do this. All Thank right. God I didn't blaze first, bro. <laughs> <laughs> Hardest dish you've ever made? Uh, oh, man. Um, maybe the first time that I attempted a beef wellington. It's always a, a welly, a welly. Yeah, I think my duck cell was probably too wet. Mm. Pastry, pastry got too moist. Uh, 
I think it was overcooked. Yeah, it was many years ago, and I don't do them too often. I just recently did them again with Chris Locke last year at Marbin for Tale of Two Chefs. We did yeah. a crazy Indian, Indian, British Indian adventure. But uh, yeah, maybe a welly man. It was pretty ugly. Dish you could never get right. I don't. Um, I here maybe is another cop out answer, bro. I mean, like, I. I I would I wouldn't accept that man if there's something that I'm doing like I made mad mistakes bro I remember back in the day at Food Dudes I burned like three balsamic glazes in a row because instead of just keeping it low this is like 2011 right 2010 instead of just keeping it low I'd always be cranky it because I have eight things going right and then just you smell the smoke and you know it's like it's like it's like this much room in between burning and glazing right so I mean like but uh, one thing I couldn't get right I don't know how to answer that bro because there's nothing that I would I would give up I wouldn't give up on anything. Okay. If, if I couldn't get something, I would keep at it. So, Private chef or executive chef of a three-star Michelin? Bro, private chef all day. Okay. I'd rather not work 21 hours a day, bro, seven days a week. I'm good. Sweet or sweet? I, I love how Marco got his stars and just gave him back. He's like, okay, yeah. peace. Uh, for those who are watching, he's talking about Marco Pierre. <laughs> yeah. All right, sweet or savory? Oh, man, savory all day. Family style? Or bells and whistles, full out tasting. Family style. Okay. All right. I know like Romaine would rather, we talk about this, bro. Romaine would rather do like 18 courses. Man, I just did a catering in Kleinberg. Beautiful house, massive backyard, outdoor kitchen. Family style, family style. Same when I'm in Turks and Caicos, it's, all, it's generally always all family style. It's easier. Again, this goes back tying into me saying you can see what's on the plate. I love Hardy. Also, from my catering background with food dudes, family style falls in line with that. So I'm much more comfortable doing that, and I really enjoy it. So Cool. All right, let's go right into now look good. So look good, it's all about health and aesthetics and fashion and all that kind of stuff. And that's all you. You're very much very fashionable. So Bro, I was, I was so stale for so long. I'd only wear all black. I remember like ex-girlfriends, like I used to get chirped for how I dressed. I don't know what changed, but people are calling me fashionable. Like my nails now. Dude, we're talking um, about that. Shellac, okay. matte. Let's go Bro, right into it. it. What's, what's with it? What's with the nails? <laughs> um, dude, I've, I, I wanted to do it for a while. I love the form of self-expression. I love when people call me weird because I respond with, what's it like living in that box that you're in? I think that's a great thing. Um, also, I'm a different generation. You know, like I love piercings. I got this beard and stuff. I mean... I, and you know what's cool is that I'm so much into pinks and different colors now, like lavender, yeah. obviously. But it started with the straps on my apron. So my aprons became a way yeah. for me. Once once the my me chef, Mitchell, started making me different color aprons, big plug, big shout out, great guy, Canadian. So once he started making me aprons with different colors, it really started getting me out of my box. Now I'm just full out pink, bright red. It is what it is, man. You know, I'm not hurting nobody, so I'm going to do Absolutely. my thing. For sure. And, that's, and as chefs... We never really got chances to show our individualism or express yeah. stuff. It's always the same white, the same aprons, the same everything, right? Um, so it's good. I had to ask that. Definitely had to ask that because some nowadays chefs don't look like what chefs used to look like, right? It's it's very different. Someone would go down the street and they wouldn't think you're a chef, right? A lot of uh, times, yeah, they don't think I'm a chef, right? You know? Like people would be like, "Who are you?" Like I was like, "You could you could look like anything." Exactly. Agreed. Yeah, that's um, fine. Let's talk about something else, which is you've got ink. I've got ink. Yeah, yeah. And this is something that I think I don't get to ask a lot of chefs um, on like something for everybody else to see, but it's like, how do you protect your ink when you're cooking? So like, have you ever gotten like splatters, cuts and burns and... Bro, I'm an idiot, okay? Like I have, you know what's funny is that over chef dev at home i did sustain man i got a nasty one here bro not on my ink yeah, I don't, yeah. can you see I that see, i see that there's one. this line here is that from your man, cast iron? bro it was a stainless steel cast iron pen and what i did so let's let's say chef dev at home this is you know i film tight like you okay. but i'm tight yeah you're there's nowhere fine. to hide so i'm in this window and what i do sometimes is i had that wide pen here and then i turn my cutting board this way. Sorry, I turn my cutting board this way. Yeah. So now it, the cutting board is here and the burner is here. So it's so tight. I was filming that episode and I leaned forward. I think it was the falafel episode. I leaned forward and it kissed it and it just went completely white and it left such nasty scar. No, I feel you. Yo, I just, uh, I have do not disturb on, but that's a call from Anger Inc. in Montreal. I'm going for a tattoo soon. 
but I have other burns on my arm. But to answer your question, I don't protect it the way I should. I'm also not, not working a line, you know, 10, 12 hours a day, every day. So my cooking, I don't cook as much as I used to cook. Even when I was traveling, even last year, like I'm catering once or twice a week or doing my demos or sitting down or whatever, but it's not like all day, every day. Um, this is maybe a bit of an excuse, but I didn't feel the need to protect it that much, but I should, I should, I should. Cause I love it so much, man. I love this stuff. Dang, I agree. I agree. Um, all right, let's get right into reps and sets. So these are rapid fire questions for look good. Cool. Black or pink? Both, man. Gotta choose one. Gotta choose pink. one. Pink? Uh, yeah. Yeah. Chef whites or t-shirt and apron? You already know. <sighs> Ladder. Oh, okay. Crocs or Burks? Crocs. Really? It's what I know. It's what's comfortable. I have them at the front there. What color do you have? Just These the ones are camel. Um, you would. You totally would. <laughs> Next one. Would you wrap tall chef hat or the fluffy sort of poofy chef one? Tall chef hat or the puffy one? Like, like the very, I guess the very French one? Like the, the very French food. Yeah. T tall and clean, man. Symmetrical, tall. Yeah, cool. first. All right. Next thing, let's go right into is let's talk live great. Cool. So we've got eat good, we talk food, look good, a style, aesthetics, live good, live great. It's it's life. It's entrepreneurship. It's it's everything about our lifestyle that we've created that is not typically like a chef, like a regular chef. So one of the one of the first things I want to ask you is. You're somebody who I think is one of the chefs that I know that has more partnerships <laughs> with brands than any other maybe chef that is managed. What I mean by that is you have no management. You have no management. So you do all this yourself. You're a one man team. We talked about this right from the get when like I'm not anymore. I was for many years. You were for a bit. I'm not anymore. Not anymore. But before that, you were. And you did yeah, it man. yourself. Yeah, I did I did everything. Accounting, BDM, everything, front of house, everything, going and picking tap bong every other day, like everything, everything, everything. What do you? What would be an advice for somebody that goes to you and say, "Hey, Jeff, I want to be a private chef, or I want to, you know, do catering. I'm, I want to go and get brand collaborations and all that kind of stuff." What What's the deal? How do I do it? I'll share something very personal. When I left the food dudes in 2012 to go work at Lux and be an executive chef and work four days a week and make bank and fucking be off at 6 PM and off on weekends. A lot of the food dudes had like ill wishes for me, man. A lot of the, I'm not going to name any names like Adrian's my boy till for, he's always going to be my big bro. I'm not saying he's, he didn't say anything, but I mean like there were cooks there were like, fuck, what are you leaving us for, man? I was sous chef at the time. Where the fuck are you going, man? Like, why are you leaving? Are you going to go do demos for, for old people and this and that, blah, blah, blah but I knew I needed to get out under that umbrella and I knew I needed to start working smarter and being there gave me a lot more time to work on different projects like chef battles, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. What I'm trying to get at with this conversation is that while I was doing it, I didn't know what I was doing or what I was working for. I just knew I needed more experience. I knew I needed to get on my own and build my name. That's what I knew. So this is tying into what I'm going to share, which is, my advice to someone who wants to go into the private chef industry is to write out a plan and write out goals. I didn't write goals. I didn't do all this media for so long saying one day I want to start doing tons of brand partnerships and represent them. And you know, cause man, the money is, 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 is spectacular compared to what we would make in the industry. So, and, and these brands work with me because of all the training and media practice that I've had and I've put myself through. I didn't really know to lead to this. So my number one advice is to anyone that wants to become a private chef or want to follow in my footsteps or your footsteps is to write out your goals. What do you really want at the end of the day? This is something that I was always told to do. Write out your goals, five, 10, 15 years. And I never did it. I've done it recently, mm -hmm. but that's what I would recommend is to write out your goals. What do you really want to get at the end of the day? Do you want to start working with bigger brands and big partnerships? Because if that's the goal, then you can start doing things that you need to get there. And another, th another great tip of advice that I can have is, give, is get an amazing mentor, someone who you want to trade places with, Ooh, someone that offers you sound advice, and someone that tells you shit that you don't want to fucking hear. Someone that tells you borderline hurtful shit. Like, oh man, that's amazing. You just did this? What the fuck's next, bro? That's what I, that's what you, that's, that's hard, but that's how, I'm a tough love kind of guy. Who would be your mentor then? I have several, bro. 
I have, I don't need to name them, but I have several. Anybody that you see me messing with, I want to say fucking with anybody you see me messing with, like, like Alec, for example, Alec is a spiritual and fitness coach for me, bro. Bro, I put a mad weight during COVID. Alec pulled me out of that rut. There's anger Inca tattoos again calling me. Man, do not disturb has to be adjusted on this one. Uh, Kabir is another mentor for me, but again, with different things. Um, in terms of how to handle my business, how to manage my team, that's all Kabir. He's director of communications for me, right? And I have several other people that I reach out to. I don't have one specific person, but uh, find someone that's going to push you and tell you shit you don't want to hear. Really important, man. Because again, I didn't think I needed a mentor several years ago. I thought I had it all fucking figured out, bro. I don't know shit. I know nothing. Sick. So, yeah. It's, it's one of those where a lot of people ask. A lot of people ask and try to figure it out because they want to, right? Especially with nowadays with like influencer game and the whole, all the brands coming up and just putting it out there. It's very difficult to set, set the tone, set the tone to get exactly like what you, what to a level where you get to, for example, where you've got bigger brands on a constant, consistent basis that are paying versus giving product for free for a post or something like that. Right. Uh, something I want to get into that's totally not cooking, totally not fashion. DJ. I knew it. I knew you were going to say it. Gotta, let's talk about this. What is up with the DJ? Where'd you get started? How'd you get started? Do you still so, play anywhere? So I grew up, my first loves, you know, are, are definitely hip hop. I grew up on Gangstar, Blackstar, you know, Mob, 36, Midnight, I'll just start firing albums, Midnight Marauders, like these are, and I'm obsessed with 80s, like Fleetwood Mac, Enya, you're with, like all that, Genesis, like I'm obsessed with that kind of stuff. Um, music is infatuating for me. What I learned was I learned uh, how to start DJing on a couple different programs, mainly Tractor, in the house music scene, another massive love for me. Yeah. Um, in grade nine, I went to, I went to a rave. Ah, my parents, this is the first time they'll ever hear about this. In grade nine, I went to a rave, man, and uh, it was drum and bass. And D&B just changed my life, bro. And then 2016, spending time in London, I spent a week in Bristol, the home of D&B. That's how that, that ties in. But um, the DJ thing, yeah, man. It, it's, it, it, I'm obsessed with music, and, and I'm really good with track names and stuff like that, too, right? So I could walk into places, and I could DJ by downloading on the spot. Blend, I'd play a track, download, play a track, download another one, and I'd be blending it in. And I did this for many, many, many hours one day. And uh, when you take two tracks in house and you blend them together, you almost create a new sound with the layering. So that's really exciting for me. And then when I learned that, I was playing after parties. And what happened was my boys who DJ in Toronto, they're pretty big local guys. Um, a lot of them are in Brigada and stuff, which is a pretty big local name. They started booking me in. They started booking me into Parlor and I played Escobar and then I started playing other shit. And then, yeah, man, that's how that started. I mostly play house music. DJing and then I've just been recently working on a project whereby man my boy Conrad and I are DJing on vinyl bro which is a dream come true while cooking we have a station two tech 12s a mixer laptop and then we have a cutting board and a and uh and uh, I have my burner my camping style burner there and we're switching every two tracks bro mix two tracks Mahomie searing steak, breaking down Chantal's, and then you switch, and then you're building lobster mac and cheese, switch, building vegan Caesar, switch. So it's like the most exciting thing. And music are very similar. I've always, always said that, and where it's like what you said, blending two songs creates a different vibe. Putting two different cuisines or two different ingredients gives you a different recipe, a different taste that no one ever seen before or taste before. That's, that's crazy. It's also a universal language. Conrad's played around the world. You don't need to know the language and you know, whether he's in Costa Rica or he is. You know, when I was in Scotland, I don't speak Punjabi. Like, I was, I was speaking, it was, these guys have been, you know, they speak strictly uh, Punjabi over there when I was over there. So, like, I don't speak that, but, you know, just by tasting and smiling and, you know, smelling, like, that's all you really need. So, just like you're saying, um, it's two things that are very subjective, but also they are universal languages. It's rare to say that about cool. stuff, so. All right, we're going to get now into YOLO. All right, we're going to get right into YOLO. Another rapid fire, chef or DJ? Had to choose. Oh man, uh, I ha it's like I set you pink, up for that, bro. One. I set you up for that one. It's like black and pink. I can't choose. You chose. You chose pink. I, I did. I know, but I I wanted to say blank. Um, let's <sighs> rap so much for rapid fire. Taking my sweet time, chef. Super painful. That's that's not. I'm not happy about that. It's it is what it is. All right, um, would you rather have a television show or would you rather have a YouTube channel with 
a million subscribers. You're killing me, bro. I'm going to go with... We're in the weeds for a reason. This is what we do. I'm going to go with... I'm going to go with... Tele well, here, you know what? Here, my I had a dream of having a television show, watching like Emeril uh, growing up and many other, many other chefs on, on television. But now... I would say a YouTube channel. The reason why is I feel that it would get more eyes and I have more creative control over it. So I'm gonna go with YouTube, but I had to think about that. These questions are outstanding. Yeah. All right, last one is, person you would wanna cook the most for? What do you mean, cook the most? Like, the person like I wanna cook? Oh, you mean the person that I wanna cook the most for? Okay, um, dead or alive? Doesn't matter. Uh, my bro, my brother. My brother, for sure. Yeah, thousand percent. Thousand percent. Cause cause he left in like he left us in two thousand and six, bro. So like I really kicked up the gears cooking a couple years after, like and he was cooking too. Like he wasn't cooking okay. at big restaurants or anything, but he, he he definitely fucked with food and, and, wow. and he was the guy that first took me for pho and KBBQ and uh and salad king when it was just two tables back in the day of ryerson like in late 90s like that shit gotcha. jai was everything so yeah so yeah that's that's an easy one yeah. easiest question i've had all day all right so we're gonna get into something called social hour cool so yeah go digital deep dive into all your socials dude i'm gonna pull up we're gonna share my screen and the first we feast it's like hot ones we're gonna have a little bit of you know some stuff so oh this is cool this is just like sean evans so we're gonna share my screen here All right, you see this? Um, oh, fuck me. That was my first episode ever, bro. All right, that's your first, exactly. So that's your first episode when I was 20, what is that? 2014? It would be 24, it would be March 2014. Were you nervous? Were you, what was, what was going on in your head? How old were you? Bro, bro that was six years ago. I was 30. No, so I was 29, I think. I, um, yeah, man, I was doing, bro, Man, I think I did like a, I was cooking tilapia back then, which I stopped cooking, but I think I was doing like an urban panko crusted tilapia on top of like a pearl couscous or a grilled mango salsa on there. Say, and like, is there a, a roasted red pepper in there? there there's, yeah, there's a roasted red pepper chimichurri. This is the pepper roll. This pretty, I went on that show and did that pepper roll, which we cooks are very familiar with, but they lost it, man. City Line flipped out. And I went home and I think I took a nap. I had a long weekend that weekend. I went home and took a nap and I woke up to Yo, We Love It, We Want You to Start Doing Two Segments. That's also the last time I wore a black V-neck. Why? Tracy's also, Tracy's also the coolest fucking person on the, on the planet. She's always been so supportive of me. She came and judged Chef Battles for us back in the day. Um, she, she was just very supportive and she made that job so much easier. And we filmed as recently as last week, you know, together. Yeah. So like, I just got to shout her out, man. She's one in a kajillion billion. Amazing. Amazing. It's crazy. It's like, she's still killing it. She's still killing it, bro. She's, she's killing it, bro. All right, dude. Next one. That guy. Did you see that one? Did you see that? All right, Dad, Yo, this. Jesus Christ, man. A couple years ago, uh, city moguls. They basically picked 20 people in, in Toronto that are entrepreneurs and that are also doing philanthropic work that are giving back to the community and uh instead of just shining a light on us and all this shit they they use us to promote our platform but at the same time to raise funds this was to raise funds to combat sex trafficking which is a major major issue currently and has been in the past it's a big big problem man so this i think they raised 50 grand or something for it but they throw a fashion show and i was the first person to walk the runway for that and that was a really cool production and i'm proud to be a part of it man because i was the culinary guy that they picked that year so super proud of that amazing All right, yeah dude. man's got turned that night 100 percent. that's something we haven't done yet actually we haven't yeah yeah you're together yet and we haven't partied together yet. Man, you know, we were kicking it that day with burger drops, right? But yeah, I look forward to uh, I look forward to spending some quality time with you. Yeah, but we'll, we'll we'll chop that up soon. Sure. All right, dude. Next one. Oh man, bro, this is fresh, bro. This is fresh. Um, I was in. I was traveling the first three months of this year. Uh, I did a. I went to India for a month, and within that month, I did a two week cruise. We started from Mumbai to Mangalore. 
uh, and then we did Colombo, Maldives, Cochin, and and and, and, and different places. Um, Go if I didn't mention that, but this is in Colombo. I'm in Colombo and I'm walking through Peta Market, and uh, I see this huge bag. I think it's 40 kilos. I can't remember of uh, of green chilies. And I asked the guy, I'm like, yo, can I just throw that up and get a photo of it? I just didn't know what compelled him to do that. You can check, see homie in the blue shirt in the back. It's like, yo, this is kind of cool. But um, yeah, I hoisted that thing up on, on, and then my homie took a photo of me. But uh, yeah, I just kind of wanted to be, feel like a part of the team there, man. Like, obviously, so you're the same way, bro. Anywhere that you travel, you're hitting up all the markets. That's the first stop, yeah. right? So walking through that and seeing a bag of those chilies, because Sri Lanka and Colombo is the hottest food I've eaten anywhere in the world. Anywhere. It's the hottest number one. Right. So I think I, that, that I just, I was inspired by chili, man. I just grabbed the bag. I'm like, let me see if I can hoist this up. So that, that's the story behind that. And that's fresh, bro. That's a few months ago. The colors though, right away. It's like wild, crazy. All the colors in this photo is insane. Are yeah, it's 40 degrees too. I see that. Look at those arms, by the way, those arms, Dev. You know what? It was pressed against my body. So I'm not even gonna lie. Don't tell everybody the secret, dude. Man, like it is what it is, bro. I kid. All right, next one. <laughs> oh, sweet, man. This is Essex. Is this Essex County? Yeah. Little Miranda. Yeah, uh, so basically, LCB. Oh, so I'm in Scotland last year. I'm sitting at a bar having a pint after my shift. And I get a phone call from a director. And he's like, Dev, man, LCBO really has you on the short list of names. They really... They're, they're, they're really looking to see if you're interested in hosting the show, exploring artisanal food and drink across Ontario. I didn't know what the budget was going to be like. I didn't know anything. So I kind of brushed it off. But I still, like, I, I got in contact and I, I got in the information that I needed. But I get reached out to a lot. Or I was getting reached out to a lot. And things didn't always pan out, whether that's Food Network or whatever it is. We, I'm not trying to single out anybody. But I just didn't know what was going to happen. Um, next thing you know, I come back home and I have a screen test. So I'm sitting at a bench uh, with a couple different people. One of them was Miranda. And we're chatting about uh, we're chatting about drinking beer, drinking beers, and just 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 shooting the shit and chatting. And I realized I had it when yeah, that's another photo. I realized I got the job when I got to stay on the bench, and then someone else came. Uh, so they were interviewing, they were auditioning for for the female co-host or the co-host for that show. Super exciting experience. I did six shows, and uh, I got to see I got to see some of the most amazing things. In fact, Emerald Grasslands, my favorite butter. I have butter being delivered to my house today from Drew. I met Drew on this show, um, Colaport Trout Farm, uh, Vicky's Veggies, like uh, Spirit Tree Cider and Caledon. Like I can throw so many names at you right now and I feel connected to these people. And it goes back to my Lavender video where I'm like, I spend the world, I go all around the world traveling and there's so much in my backyard, in Cream or in Collingwood, in Essex County that you just can just stay right here and it's all here. I'm pretty sure that's Essex County and I'm pretty yeah, sure that was our last, our last episode. Yeah. Oh, shout out to, Mar sorry to cut you off. Shout out to Miranda, Little Miss Piggy. She's a rock star. I used her Food Network recipe to make my beaver tails for my Chapman's video I just did. But I love that girl more than most people that I speak to on a daily basis. Amazing. And I think we got to preface this. Do you remember when I messaged you about this? Uh, what'd you say? I was on that short list. Yo, you were, you were, you were. I remember <laughs> I got the call from the director. Like, yeah, sorry, we chose someone else. His name's Dev. I'm like, fuck. And then, and then you were supposed to be on the show too, though, right? Yes, yes. And then I, I was like, oh. And then they're like, maybe we'll get you onto one of these posts and we'll get to go. I'm like, cool. That works too. I don't mind. Now, now I remember, man. Now I remember, bro. But we're going to do something amazing. exciting together. You did amazing. It was, I loved watching all the episodes. It was really, you really all I'll, I'll share something with you very quickly. I don't want to take up too much time, but I'm just going to fire off stuff at you while it's in my head. I think it'll give us some good content. But I, I auditioned back in 2016 or 2017, 2016 for CBC The Goods. And I lost out the spot I thought I had it, bro. Because I filmed my demo like sitting on like a boat surrounded by the Himalayas, like in the lake in Kashmir. And I gave them a really cool introduction that they wanted for the audition. And I lost it out to Shahir Masood, who's a homie. You know, who is I, I, I competed against him at Fridge Wars. Yeah, he's a cool dude, man. Like, yeah, I, 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 you know, but I lost it out to him and I was like, man, it winded me. And it went back to like ego and, and like things like that. And it's like every time I, I lost out on something, like another door opened up somewhere else. Right. So I firmly believe that, you know, I didn't get I didn't get everything I wanted. I've lost lots of competitions, man. Like I've taken mad L's, but I'm still here. I know. Uh, next You're question. still there. Yeah. We're still here. Okay, just a couple First more, and that's it. All right, dude. Sick. This was big, man. This I know, was big. I wanted, to, I wanted to bring this up on purpose because 
um, shout out to Toronto Life. They do an amazing job for this. Is Word. showing people that there's great food outside of the core. Bro, and like I'm Richmond Hill, born and raised, but like if there's life changing food at Aaron Mills 401, like Coffee the Con, or Drew Petit's at like Birchmount Ellesmere, or like just like, no matter where you are, if there's amazing food, I'm gonna come there and I'll drive an hour to get there. So Scarborough, I know, I know very well. Um, I'm pretty sure I reached out to Toronto Life, maybe through Suresh or someone, I don't know who, mm. but I reached out and they're like, yeah, we'd love to do something a bit on this. So that's how that came about. I also want to mention that Sapphire, S-A-Fire, was closed on Monday, but they are way up there on my list of Guyanese food, but we went on a Monday, so we went to Tropical Nights, et cetera, et cetera, but Sapphire Restaurant is critical, and this was a good opportunity to shine the light on Guyanese food. And this ties back into what I was talking at the very beginning of our conversation about being really inspired by my childhood. I just did a lamb pepper pot samosa at East Restaurant with cherry with smoked yogurt, and people lost their minds, bro. Especially Guyanese, because we eat pepper pot one way. It's very unique, and you eat it at Christmas. So for me to take it and put it in a different vessel, I'm very proud and excited to do that in my Chef Dev at Home videos and online. Like even even yesterday, I was wearing a Guyana wristband. Like I'm very very proud of my heritage and I love it and I'm going to spend way more time focused on uh, Guyanese and Desi food as well but Guyanese food especially so I'm glad you brought that up got you all right we just got two more cool I love this man this is like so much fun dude yo we talked about this today bro yo so my current agent his name is Mark he works for on the go magazine um I guess it's public now but he oh, sells okay. ads in that magazine. I, I did not know this. This this sort of like coincidence thing. Bro, I and I spoke to my social media girl today about this post because I think we're taking this post and we're posting it this week because next week I'm doing another billboard. It's August 16th to 23rd. It's a 10 second video that's going to run uh, 10 seconds every hour for a week. Um, but uh, yeah, so he's like, yo, I, I got this magazine thinking of you for a cover. And again, same thing as LCBO. I kind of brushed it off. Because not everything pans out. So I get my boy Alec, my trainer, took that shot, by the way, the best photographer in the game. But um, yeah, so I know I'm going to be on On The Go magazine. I know it goes up on screens in the path. He's like, we'll get you up in Dundas Square, maybe. And then he's like, you know, it's in all the blue bins. It's, it's everywhere. It's all the go. It's everywhere. Um, this thing was huge for me, go, me, bro. When I was at Lock and Key, like uh, this one up. And then also, depending on where you are in the downtown core, Scorpion by Drake came out. Drake is my number one dream is to cook for Drake, by the way. But uh, if I can cook for anyone, it's Drake. Who did I say before? I said my bro. Alive, Drake. I agree. Totally. Yeah. Agree. We'll do it together. But my <laughs> boy's eating lunch. He looks out the window and he sent me a photo. It's me and then Scorpion, Drake right above. <laughs> but yeah, this is a big deal, man. And this is, the, again, this goes back to things where you said, like, did you make it? Or did you, this is when you knew that you were on the right path. Like, this was a pretty big fucking deal, man. Because, yo, this went, also went up in Times Square. Yes. I, exactly what I, was, I wanted to make sure we brought that up was, this was not just Young Dundas Square. It was also in Times Square. Yeah. <laughs> and we're going to do it again. Again and again. Amazing, dude. Amazing. All right. This last one, I just had to post it up because I feel like it embodies <laughs> you in a very, very good way. Um, so. What are you going to show? <laughs> yo so uh, oh my god this is so another photo taken by alec yo this is actually a great photo not because of what i'm doing but this is a good example of how hard working pays off how hard work pays off because bro i filmed this for a segment called rmc real men cook i spent an entire day shooting for a half day or five six hours shooting four ep episodes it hasn't seen the light of day we haven't released it. It's just another thing that, bro, I keep filming. I keep stacking. I keep making shit happen as much as I can. You and, and people may never see it, but I keep pumping and pumping and pumping. This is a great example, aside from what I'm doing, like an idiot. Aside from that, um, this is a good example of what we're talking about before, like that mad hard work that's, re that's required. Like people will never see these episodes that I filmed, but I spent a lot of time, energy, and effort like prepping the set, prepping the set for that and everything. Like it was a lot of work, bro hasn't even seen the light of day so and what did i write there did i say something's coming no i didn't no i didn't i didn't hint anything the look back. but yeah that's a great and that's not 2019 that photo is 2017 or something like that it was older than i reposted at that time and i'm sure if i repost that now it might get a little bit of traction huh oh dude i don't know why don't you just do a new one same one and just 
throw it back. I'm dedicating it to you. Oh, dude. <laughs> Gabe. But I wanted to bring this one on purpose because, like I said, it embodies you. What I mean by that is what I saw first was not you, but was what was behind the view, which is the setup, the blue bin, the tape, the, the towels. Bro, the I've never even looked at – I don't think I've ever even really looked at that. When I saw this photo, I'm like, people will see you. They'll see sort of what you're looking, you're dressing, yeah. what you're doing, but they don't see that you're actually on set. You're actually Dude, doing something. I don't really remember ever noticing that. I've always looked at my tongue and the tie and the belt. That's what I mean. Everybody I don't think I've ever thought of that. So I brought it up because I wanted to say is that a lot of people notice and first thing that they see is the glitz, the glam, the success, all the partnerships, all of that. But what they don't see is, dude, making food content and being a food ambassador, influencer, it's much different and harder than people think compared to, say, a fashion blogger or other. Because for a fashion influencer or something like that, you you just look good, put some clothes on, take a shot. For a food influencer, for a chef, for a brand ambassador, we got to buy ingredients. We got to cook things. We got to prep it. We got to clean it. We got to bring it to everywhere. And then, then, Bro. then we got, then you make a recipe and all this kind of stuff. And then you shoot. It's and mind boggling, bro. Video and, and tutorial and all these kind of things. Right. You see that. Right. And, 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 and similar to me and maybe even you even more so you spend a lot of time taking photos and styling and like, yeah, working on that, that big project that you did. Um, the plan that you created, everything like that. But yo, bro, that's one of like four bus bins back then. I've gotten a lot tighter with the way I pack, a lot smarter. I've started to combine ingredients where I can because I've been on the road. I know dude, I must have been counted everywhere. But that's like one of four bus bins, bro. It's so much work. If I have to set up to shoot outside, man, it's, it, it, it's, it's my knees are going, bro. I have MRIs for my knees. Uh, supposed to be tomorrow, but I think it's going to be early next week. The requisition's done. But yeah, I'm falling apart a bit. It's a lot of work, man. It's a lot. We're on our feet all day. We talked about this, and this is like just open for everybody. It's like me and Dev, we 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 go back. Me and you will go back and be like, "Yo, dude, it's hard, right?" There's times where there would be like, "This is like really, really hard," and people don't see it and like don't realize like how how are you doing or like, and you're like, "Yo, dude, I am so I'm a one man team." And yeah, bro. I brought this photo, man. This photo was a very good embodiment of everything. Yeah, and I didn't even notice that shit before at the back. And yeah, it's also like you didn't know that we were filming something here that has never been released, you know, for whatever reason with the editing. And then when I look back at it, probably around when I posted that photo in 2019, I just wasn't happy with it um, because it was a bit dated for me now. But um, yeah, we spent a lot of time on that. Never saw the light of day. It's one of many things I've done. Dude, for sure. That's it. But yeah, yeah. I'm going to pull that out. Now, that's pretty much it, dude. I know you're a dude. busy man. You, you yeah, I spoke a lot, life. man. And the time went by super, super fast. It did. But um, uh, I wanted also is that you're on TV, you're on your gram, you're on all that kind of stuff. But now you're on the Serving It Up podcast. This is your little platform right now. Go let the people know anything you want them to know, where to find you, maybe what you got going on that you want to promote. It's all yours, dude. I, I, I thank you, man. And then a big thank you to you. I've always mentioned how much that you inspire me too. So I think I want to make that very clear. Uh, so I'm very honored and, and flattered and proud that you, you brought me on this segment with you. And I'll always be there to work with you and share stuff with you, man. We're always going to be homies. I need to make that clear. Um, yeah. So basically everything I got, go- I have some big projects on the way and I don't really want to give anything away. I think I chatted about some stuff coming up, like the billboards coming back. I have something really big coming up, man. And I think I've shared it with you, but I don't really want to let it out here. All the things that I have coming up, it's all on the Instagram. It's all on Facebook. I have a girl managing. I have someone managing my social media now who's amazing, which is good. And the reason why I'm mentioning that is because it's allowing me to provide more accurate and relevant information to my audience than anyone that wants to look up on me. So you check. So people are always like, yo, I get like my friends like, Deb, next time you do a pop-up, can you reach out? And I'm like, are you kidding me, man? How am I supposed to, do I got to make notes about this? So, so I'm just like, just keep an eye on the gram. I have some really cool stuff coming. I have a publication of, of sorts coming as well. So a lot of people have asked me about a cookbook. It's not your traditional cookbook, but there is some kind of content coming. I plan on encompassing in a document all the Chef Dev at Home stuff. So I put up over 60 videos, plan on putting that all together for something. Um, I have something to do 
with a man. You know what, bro? As much as I want to say it, I'm not going to say it, but it's going to allow people across nationwide to have a little chef dev in their own home. Okay. That's all I'm going to say. I don't want to give anything away uh, until I'm, my, my until brain I'm really kind of going and I feel like I kind of know what you're getting at. I'll message you. Yeah, after, man. But... yeah that, that, that's totally cool, man. Uh, I'm just constantly working on different projects. I want, I want, I want more brand partnerships, but you, all the brand partnerships I'm taking now, it has to, and I said this yesterday on a really important phone call, but it's, um, it has to be in line with my brand and where I'm going. And, and, and again, going back to what I was saying about goals, it's really important that what I do now is in line with my vision. Cause before, like I said, I was a yes man. If you told me to go stand up in a grocery store, if you told me to go do this there, or, or this, this would give me, pay me a grand or whatever, I'd be gone, bro. But now I'm trying to just fine tune a little bit because I'm working on my brand. So yeah, not too much to share on what's up and coming. You know, I'm always doing exciting st stuff. I'd like to try to do that, but it's all on the gram, man. It's there for anyone to go see. It's all on Facebook. So, and you can always DM me if you really want to know. Gotcha. For real. All, all, right. Right, all right, guys. So Dev, thanks for joining. And guys, this was episode six of the podcast. Catch you guys on the next one. Cheers, brother. Cheers, chef. Yeah. <laughs>